And then I would I would cough. But oh, I made it through. I kept the faith. Thank the Lord. <laughs> That's the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord. Pray for us. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and see oh his glory. Stand still and God. Thank you. 
message or messages, whatever you, however you want to look at it. Last week we, I'm going to title the message the same every time, but I'm dealing with a different aspect each time. All okay. right. So the title is Savior, Master, Lord. Mm -hmm. And who is that? Jesus. Jesus. If Jesus is our all and in all, he is not just our Savior. He is also our Master and our Lord. Now, last week, I think if, if you remembered anything at all, the greater part that you would have remembered was the difference between an apology and repentance. Mm -hmm. And I just want to maybe clarify a little bit of something here. I don't want to linger there because that's not my thought today. Um, there was a little bit of a few comments with regard to uh, apology, not necessarily being requiring a defense. But that's the definition of apology. And you can look in the dictionary and you'll find different things, different thoughts. But here's really the main thrust. An apology doesn't mean a heart change. Repentance does. Yes. And that's the difference, really, the, at the crux. You can apologize or you can repent without using the word repent. Or you can repent without saying necessarily... Um, or, or shall I say, you're going to pop, well, anyway. Bottom line is, you can say, I'm sorry without saying, forgive me. But if it doesn't bring a change, that's all it is, is an apology. Repentance makes, brings a change. So that's really the thrust of it. So we want to move on now. Let's go to John chapter 13. St. John chapter 13. Help us, Lord. 
Today we're going to talk about the master aspect of our Savior, of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He has a lot of titles and names that we can refer to him as, but of course he is indeed the Messiah. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. Amen. Yes. But is he our Master? Is he our Lord? Oh my. So today we're going to talk with about the master aspect of who Jesus is. In John chapter 13, we're going to begin reading from verse number 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if you do them. This, of course, is a scene of what we often refer to as the Lord's Supper. And that's not the thrust of our message either. We're wanting to talk about the fact that the his disciples were calling him master, and they also called him Lord. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said to them, you have said well, because I am your master, and I am your Lord. But in this particular scene, Jesus is teaching them a lesson in servant leadership. And even though um, eventually they would become leaders, they still were servant leaders. In other words, we are called to serve. We're not called to be served. Now, for three and a half years, Jesus spent his life, many hours, many hours with his disciples, teaching them foundational truths. And in understanding what he was teaching, he was actually completing or concluding Mosaic Law. He didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. And so they got a, an understanding of who Jesus was or is. And here he is. He's completing the law. He's fulfilling the law and teaching them how to transition from Moses' law to Christ's law, which is the law of grace. And John, the first chapter, if you'll flip back there real quickly, St. John chapter 1 and verse 17, the Bible says, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So God, Christ is, had come to transition them into a different kind of law, a different dispensation, often referred to as grace and truth. The Mosaic Law was filled with rituals, ceremonies, and all these do's and don'ts, and you can't do and you must do, and consequences accordingly. My Lord. Now, yes. Jesus took advantage of every teachable moment he could. Keep in mind, the word master means teacher. Mm -hmm. So we are to be taught. If, he's our, if he is your master, that means he can teach you what you need to know. Yes. And if we are not teachable... Forget about calling Jesus your Savior, Master, and Lord. So there were many, um, many teachable moments in that three and a half year period. And actually there were a lot of things they didn't understand. They couldn't comprehend. It was a difficult thing for the Jewish nation to transition from the Mosaic Law into grace and truth and the New Covenant. So there were many things that he taught them that didn't really register with them until after he ascended. After he was crucified, resurrected, and went back to heaven. You'll read in the scripture in different places, and I'm not giving uh, scripture references, where they recalled. Certain things happened, and they remembered what the master had said to them. Now it came clear, and they understood what he was talking about. And all of those times, they traveled up and down many dusty roads. And he used objects around even to teach them object lessons. He used a fig tree, taught them a lesson from that. 
He talked and talked about fruit trees and so forth, teaching them lessons. He taught many, many, many things in parables, stories. And then, so even then, sometimes they had a hard time understanding. Oh, yes, that's right. From Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, that we often refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, that is filled with life lessons. He was introducing things to them they'd never heard of before. And so he had a, truly a big job on his hands. But many of those lessons have to do with just actual practical living. How to get along with your neighbor, love your neighbor, and, and all about the kind of spirit that we should have, the be attitudes, and on and on it goes. All of these things. And though in those chapters, he taught lessons on interpersonal relationships, and he taught lessons on our relationship to God. All of that was in there. All the way from Matthew in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Different authors taught many of the same things from a different angle, a different perspective. Right, right. Fulfilling all of what you and I need to know in order to make it through this life successfully. So in those Gospels where we read of Christ's teachings, uh, lessons from the master of teachers. We read about the new birth, mm -hmm. what it means to be born again. Mm -hmm. Not church joining, not shaking the preacher's hand, not getting baptized and you're on your way to heaven, not keeping a set of rules, but an actual change of heart, mind, and spirit. Yeah. The new birth. We read about that from the master of teachers. Yes, my God. Taught us how to, to love our neighbor. And he gave a story about that. Well, who is my neighbor? He described your neighbor ultimately is anybody you have opportunity to do good to. That's your neighbor. We read in there uh, and learn from the scriptures about holiness. And those who sinned, and he dealt with them, and he said, go and sin no more. So we read about holy living, sin-free living, and all of these things that we read about in the scripture were actually recorded, written after he went back to heaven. They didn't have a, a manual, as it were, when he walked the shores of time. They learned from him teaching mouth to mouth. They came in through their ears. It wasn't from something they read other than from the old law. And then he transitioned them. So it amazes me even to this day how in all of that three and a half years, how they were able to recall all of those experiences. And within a few years of him going back to heaven, they recorded it in what we now have as the Bible. There are those who would say that, oh, well, that was written way hundreds of years later, and it's not accurate. Not true. We have plenty of proof to show that within just a few decades, they had written what we now call this portion of the Bible. Now let us go to Matthew chapter 23. My God, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. We're talking about the master, and the real question is today, is Jesus your master? Mm. Is Jesus your master? Can you call him master? Amen. It's not often that we hear it in this context. It's not often that we even think about Jesus as being master necessarily. But master, keep in mind, means teacher or rabbi. And he was a rabbi. All right, Matthew chapter 23. I'm going to read the first seven verses. So stick with me. Mm -hmm. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne or carried, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries. And we talked about this a week or two ago, about what the phylacteries were, these little leather boxes, and inside they had scriptures written. They would bind them on their arms. They'd put them in the middle of their forehead and bound them there as if that was going to make them holy. Listen, Jesus came to get the word off the page and get it into our hearts and lives, yes, not to God. just carry it around. It's more than quoting scripture and more than carrying a Bible under your arm. 
It's about getting something in your soul. Amen. My God, help us, Lord. Writing the words on the tables of our heart. All their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries. In other words, if they want to be uh, look more holy, they make it bigger. Not this, just this little leather box with a few strings. No, we're going to make it bigger. That makes us better. And enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. And greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. My Lord, my God. So the scribes and the Pharisees, sitting in Moses' seat, having been filled with self-exaltation and pride, Jesus is letting the people and his disciples know they talk the talk, but they don't walk the talk. They tell you all these things to do, but they don't do it themselves. What does that describe? Nothing more than hypocrisy. And so these, he's telling them these people are hypocrites. They are men pleasers. And not only that, they are money hungry. And they're filled with pride. And they love these titles. They want to be called rabbi, which means master. They want to be the master. Now listen as we continue on a few verses. Verse 8. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's what I mentioned earlier, servant leadership. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, humble, humiliated. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So he's telling them, don't be like the scribes and Pharisees. They want to be called master, but they're living hypocritical lives and they're not qualified to be leaders. Now, if they tell you truth, you do what they say, not because of who they are, but because truth will stand on its own. My Lord, yes. So yes. do it if it's what they're supposed to do. I mean, if we're all supposed to do it, no matter who says it, God's going to hold, well, God will honor his word no matter where it comes from. I hope that makes sense. Right, right. But he said, don't you be called rabbi. Don't you be called master. One is your master, and you are brethren. You are brethren. All, everybody but Christ are brethren. Only Christ is the true master, or should be acknowledged as a true master. And you don't have to turn there, but in the 111th Psalm, and some of you probably know it already, verse number 9, the Bible says, He sent redemption unto His people. Speaking of God, he sent redemption to his people. That came in the form of Jesus Christ, he being the redeemer. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. That's all. His name. We be brethren. We be brethren. So we dare not take on these titles We don't want to take on Christ's name because that's a huge responsibility. I'm nobody's savior. I'm nobody's master or mistress in the sense of being mistress does carries a different connotation. But I'm not the master of anybody. Nobody here and nobody out there. God, it's my job to point you to the master. Right. It's my job to introduce you to the master. It's my job to tell you what the master said, but it's not my word, it's his. Right, amen. Now going back to Matthew again here in 27, verse number eight, he said, don't be called rabbi, for one is your master. Number nine, he said, call no man your father upon the earth. Now he's not talking about your biological father. He's talking about a spiritual father. And we know that there are religious organizations who do that. Right. Their, their spiritual leaders are referred to as father this and father that. 
And again, in verse 10, don't be calling yourself master. Why? Because we are all equal. I am no higher than the rest of you. The only thing that sets me apart as the pastor is my level of responsibility. That's all. And the respect that's due to someone who's expected to lead. Now, if we're all equal, tell me where all these titles come from. Apostle and bishop and archbishop and reverend and right reverend and most reverend and holy father talking about men. Or women, as the case may be. Where's all that come from? We don't, we should not want, as leaders, we should not want to be exalted to the same level that Jesus said, I'm the only master. Right. I can't put myself on the level of Jesus. Amen. And I don't want to. That's right. I do not want to. My Lord. None of us has the authority to add or subtract from what Jesus had said, has Amen. already said. Right. What he has laid down. I don't have the authority to come along now and change that. And when people do, it creates confusion. It creates actually deception. Now, two or three weeks ago, we watched something here in service. If you recall, there was a group of individuals who have been elevated to the level of apostle. Where did that come from? My Lord. My there are only 12 apostles. Paul being one because Judas forfeited his place and the one that they cast lots for, we never hear of him again. Sure but God called Paul. Technically, the only people who were qualified to be apostles were those who were personally acquainted with Jesus and saw him face to face. Some would say, well, Paul didn't see him face to face. Yeah, he did. In the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, when he was struck down on the road to Damascus, Jesus appeared to him. But he did say he felt like he was one that was born out of due season because he did not walk and talk with him as the other apostles did. Right, right. But he gained the title simply because of who he was and how he submitted himself, and he did indeed. But he said, I'm the least of all of the apostles. Right. So he didn't glory in that title. That's right. He didn't glory in it. He considered himself unworthy. So none of us has the authority to take on that. I'm not a master of anybody and don't want to be. That's just too much responsibility and too much accountability. So nobody is accountable to me. Now, there are times when we have to deal with situations and so on and so forth, and in a sense, there's some accountability there. But when it comes to the doctrine, it's not my doctrine. It's God's. Amen. It's Christ. That's right. Now, everything that the apostles taught was anchored in what Jesus taught. In the foundational truths that Jesus left on record for them and taught them and instructed them, they were anchored in the master's words. Everything. There's nothing in the Gospels, there's nothing in the New Testament that's recorded that does not line up precisely with what Jesus said. No. If it's rightly divided, if it's rightly divided. And as I mentioned earlier, Jesus taught them by the way. He taught them when he sit down, sat down and ate with people at different times. Um, he shared things as they traversed across hundreds and thousands of miles on land and on sea. He took advantage of every teachable moment to instill in them the principles of holiness because he knew one day he's going to be gone and they're going to have to carry on his mission. They did such an outstanding job that within three and a half years of the time he was ascended back to the Father, they had evangelized the whole then known world. Now the Western Hemisphere hadn't been known yet, but all of Asia Minor, Italy, Europe, Africa, Asia, that is amazing to me. And the Apostle Paul himself, it has been judged, walked over 10,000 miles in all of his evangelistic travels, not to mention all the miles he traveled by sea. There was an urgency in the gospel. But keep in mind, everything that the apostles taught was not their doctrine. It was the master's. Amen. It was the masters. The master taught them, and then they have passed it on even to us. And they 
taught Jesus himself. He taught tirelessly. I mean, he took advantage of every teachable moment. My Lord. May my God Lord. help us. Amen. Help us, Lord. That we would grasp it. He answered all kinds of questions. He demonstrated his power. He delivered from evil spirits. And you know what's kind of mystifying or very intriguing to me is that he told them that you will do greater things than I have done. And how could that be? John 14 and 12. He said, you'll do this and this and this. And he said, a greater thing, even greater, thou shalt do. Those apostles latched on to everything they could. And after his ascension, they spread the gospel to the whole world. Everything that they had learned from the master. Now, I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul did not have the privilege of walking and talking with Jesus on earth. He was in another part of the world, hundreds of miles away. And when he came to Jerusalem to sit at the feet of Gamaliel and be taught the Jewish law, that was when, I suppose, he learned about Jesus. And he learned to hate him because he was so dedicated to the law. But by the time God finished with him, or just began with him, when he was on his way to Damascus, we know the story, how that he was had letters in his pocket with permission to arrest the saints, take him to jail, or bring him to Jerusalem, or kill him, or whatever. But there was something in Saul, he was so passionate for what he believed. He honestly believed he was right. But God looked down deeper and he realized that there's something here I can use if I can get his attention. And he went to some great extremes to get Saul's attention. Struck him down on the road to Damascus. And listen, let me this just come to my mind. And I think it's in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. When he was struck down, he said, there was a voice that spoke to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why do you persecute me? You know what? Saul recognized who he was. You know how I know? Because he said, who are you, Lord? Who art thou, Lord? So he recognized him for who he was. And after he was converted, he went into Arabia for however long, and some have said it's three years. He had to unlearn some things. He had to be retaught some things. Yes, my God. And even after that, yes. because when he first got converted, he went to Jerusalem and everybody was afraid of him. There was no way that he could be effective. So he left, went back to Damascus. Then he went into Arabia. When he came back, and while he was there, he was being retaught by God himself. Unlearning, getting reprogrammed, etc., etc. Eventually, he went back to Jerusalem. He spoke with Peter and some of the leaders because he wanted to corroborate what God had showed him with what they knew to be truth, and it all meshed just like that. Amen. Amen. God will not lead us astray. Amen. God will not tell you one thing and tell me something that contradicts that. That's right. Never. That's right. Okay, so Paul considered himself a latecomer but he still had a relationship with the master. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I want to read. Now he's talking about the subject that he's dealing with here has to do with marriage and people leaving their spouses and, and so on and so forth. My God, Lord help Lord. And those who want to be married or he's telling them marriage is fine. If, you, if you're not meant to be a eunuch or if you can't handle being single, you're free to marry. Nothing wrong with that. But in his heart, he wished that other people would be like him. Just dedicated to God and don't need a wife. Lord. Everybody's not meant for that. Lord. All right. So in verse number two, now he's addressing to the people who are already married. And here's what he says. Unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Now, he had never walked and talked with Jesus. He was never on the mountainside or slept out on under the stars with him at night or walked with him all the different cities and towns and places that they went. He didn't ride a ship with Jesus as they crossed the Sea of Galilee. But he's saying here, 
Unto the merit I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. All right, so what he's saying here is this command I'm giving you is not my command. It came from God. So even Paul founded all of everything he preached on the written word of God, on the written word of Christ. He had met the master, remember? I said he went to Arabia. He learned what uh, he needed to. He collaborated with Peter and others, etc. And the apostle Paul wrote over half the New Testament. My Lord. But he had a relationship with God. Jesus was his master. There's nothing in these gospels, there's nothing in the epistles that do not agree with what Jesus taught. My Lord. Nothing. It wasn't his imagination. He said, look, I'm giving you this command, but it's really not mine. It's the Lord's. My Lord, yes. Where do we find it? In the gospels. We find it in the gospels. Verse number, uh, let's go to Mark. I'll show you where it's at. So Paul wasn't just making stuff up. He's saying, if you're married, you need to stay married. Let not the wife depart from her husband or the husband from the wife. As in, once you're married, that's it for life. That's right. Don't leave. And then he goes on and says, but if, and if she should depart, remain unmarried. Or if it should be a he. But here in Mark, and I'm, that's a whole other topic. I'm not getting into all that. Mark chapter 10 and verse 6. This is Jesus talking. Well, we'll start at 5. They had asked him, you know, well, Moses said, right, get divorced. Put her away. Jesus answered in verse 5, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave or cling to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain but one flesh, and what therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So Jesus is telling, he's teaching his people there, whoever he's talking to, those scribes and Pharisees are trying to trip him up. He said, when you're married, it's marriage for life. And you do not have a biblical reason to get married again unless one dies. The two shall become one, and there's no way you can make one into two. Then you have two halves. Okay? And so, when the Apostle Paul was saying what he said, he's referring back to what Jesus said. So once again, he was being taught by the Master. He was being taught by the master. And he said, I command you, if you're married, stay married. Right. But then he said, it's really not me. Yet not I, but the Lord. The Lord said it. And I'm repeating what the Lord said. Got it? Amen. Got the message? Amen. All right, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. There's another. Now, this apostle did walk and talk with Jesus. This apostle slept with him. This apostle uh, walked on the water at Jesus' command. Now, let's hear what he has to say in 2 Peter, the third chapter. The third chapter. Again, I say that all of the apostles taught what they had learned from the master. So we can't say, well, Peter said and John said, you can say it, you can quote from their books, but ultimately these are Christ's words. The Master. My Lord. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16. My Lord. And Peter is talking about Paul and how there were some things that he said that were hard to understand, and that those who are unlearned, it's verse 16, and unstable rest, or they twist and they turn them to their advantage, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So it doesn't pay for us to look at the word of God and try to find something that will allow us to do what's not right. That's right. People, plenty of people do it. Well, I think I have a right to do. Let me see if I can find a scripture to back me up. My Lord. You look hard enough, you'll find something that you can justify yourself with, but it's because you're unstable and you're resting the scriptures. That's right. If it's not scriptural, don't do it. All right, so he said here in verse 17 then, 
Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Away with this thought of once you're saved, you're always saved. You're always saved only if you keep yourself in the love of God and obey his word. But if you disobey and then you find ways to twist scriptures to your own personal fleshy advantage, it will go hard for you in the judgment. Any one of us. This word is sacred. It came at a huge price. And we do not have the option of changing things around. It works just like it is. We've seen it proven over and over and over again. But if we fall into some error and we fall from that steadfast drive and push that we have, once you've fallen, you can't get back up and get straightened out again, you're in a bad way. But, verse 18, he says, growing grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want Christ's knowledge. We want the Master's knowledge. We want what he gives us understanding. And all truth, listen to me now, all truth runs parallel. All truth runs parallel. This truth will not dissect with this truth. If this is truth, it will line up with the first truth. And so on and so on. All truth runs parallel. If we find contradictions, something is wrong. Some, something is not being properly interpreted. And this is why the world is filled with so much religious confusion. Because they have rested the scriptures to satisfy their own desires and their own lusts. God's word is sacred. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. God's word is sacred. It's not to be played with. It's not to be tampered with. It's not to be twisted so that we can do what we want to do. That's right. We need to line up ourselves with the word of God. Amen. Otherwise, oh, God. Jesus is not our master. Jesus is not our master. Oh, it's easy to find ways to suit our own personal preferences and our own personal agenda. And many people have done it, and they've managed to convince themselves that it's right and ended up into a deception, a deep hole that they can't get out of. My Lord. Because now they have believed a lie. And how, who's going to deliver them? They change the context. They'll, it'll contradict perhaps other principles and other scriptures. Oh, it's yes. just not a good thing. That's right. <clears throat> Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter, no, I think it's chapter 2 maybe. Let me find it here. Yeah, I didn't write that down. Right. It's actually chapter 2. Chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 7 says the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Now this is when Paul was still alive. The mystery of iniquity. There are already people resting and twisting the scriptures and changing truth. My Lord, my God. Not following what Jesus said, but finding a way around it. And it's a mystery. Because so many times, what is a mystery? A mystery is something that's unsolved. Uh, a mystery is uh, something that's secret. It works undercover. It works behind the scenes. People try to hide it. He said, it's already working. Only he who now lets, and that word means hinders, impedes, get in the way, hold down, hinder the work. Somebody is hindering something here, and the work can't go through. I remember years ago, Brother Ken and I used to say, Take your foot off the brakes, get your feet out of the way, and let the word go through. <laughs> and we need to do that. Yeah. Stop trying to be argumentative and, and try to figure out something that you're going to lose anyhow. You might win the argument, but you better be more concerned about winning heaven. All right, let's read on. Then shall that wicked, that's got a tell, uh, an uppercase W, which represents a person or a system, be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. I'm telling you, deception can go deep. And the more, the closer they get to the truth, the closer a deception is to true, being true, the more deceptive it becomes. 
with all deceivableness, verse 10, of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, oh that they might be saved. Now, this is the kicker right here. They received not the love of the truth. If we do not love truth, we can be convinced of something else. That's true. If we do not have a passion and a love for the for truth and for the truth giver, then we can be deceived. We can be tricked. That's right. And because of this, God said, speaking through Paul, because they did not learn to love God and love truth. Now, you can love God and not necessarily know certain things about truth. But if you love God and truth comes and you don't learn to love the truth that God sends, you open yourself up for a deception. <clears throat> and that working of Satan with all deceivableness, we cannot outwit the devil. You know that? You cannot outwit him. We need God to help us to keep us out of danger. Yes. And we better make him our master or we're going to end up who knows where. My Lord. Many people have, and they're not coming back. My Lord. My God. All deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because for this reason, this is why, they did not receive the love of the truth. It's one thing to hear truth, but it's another thing to love it. It's another thing to embrace it. It's another thing to live it. And we can know truth, and if we don't learn to love truth, then we're only hurting ourselves. It takes a love of the truth in order to be saved. Verse 11, and this is, this is the scary part. And because they wouldn't accept truth, they wouldn't love, they didn't love truth. For this cause, for this reason, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Oh, now it's good to read the rest of the chapter. Read it in your own time. I won't take time to do that but here. But God help us. The mystery of iniquity is at work. Already back then, and the apostles hadn't even died yet. They weren't even off the scene yet. And already the devil had his master plan in place. And unfortunately, it worked all too well. And many. But you know what? These things come by degree. If we don't love this truth, then when another truth comes, we're going to struggle with it. And little by little by little, we erode and we go down a slippery slope. And unless we recover ourselves, we're in big trouble. Big trouble. We must learn to love truth. Yes. Otherwise, yes. we open ourselves up for a strong delusion. Love truth. We must build our experience on Christ. Amen. Amen. On the Master. Yes. Now these brethren already recognized that things were working undercover to uh, undermine the church. Go to Acts chapter 20. Now this was written by Paul here in Thessalonians. Well, he's also writing something. He spent three years at Ephesus teaching and preaching and instructing the people. And now he's about to leave, and he knows he'll never see them again. Listen to his parting address in uh, Acts chapter 20. And let me see here. We're going to read from verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock. It sounds like he's talking to pastors. All the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this. I'm not speculating. I'm not suspicious. I already know. That after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. There are those who are going to come in. They're going to look like sheep, as it were. They're going to seem holy and whatever. But they're coming in to deceive. They're coming in to tear up the congregation, and they're not going to spare anybody. And if we're not grounded, and we don't really know who our master is, and we're not really following truth, we can be shaken, we can be deterred. Even if you have to leave the congregation, it's better to do that than to stay there and be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Lord, my God. Help, Lord. 
not sparing, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Remember, Jesus is the master. Man is not the master. We're not to elevate any man to a level that we would follow a man who isn't following Jesus. That's right. He said, after their own selves, speaking perverse things, to draw away, trying to build a following. Therefore, watch, remember, by the space of three years, I cease not to warn you day and night with tears. I'm trying to warn you. I'm trying to prepare you. The devil is working. He's going to do everything he can to tear up the church. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the master. Follow him. Remember, I for three years, I never stopped warning you day and night. He had a passion, the same passion that Jesus had. The same passion. That Jesus said, had said. Now I'm, I'm, I'm about to come down to the end, but I'm, hang with me. We're going back to Second Peter. Um, um, let's see here. Second Peter. This time we're going to chapter one. Second Peter, chapter one. The brethren felt a sense of urgency to warn the church: things are coming, and beware. We're not following our own imagination here. First Peter one fifteen. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, I want you to prosper after I'm long gone, to have these things always in remembrance. So they were constantly telling, reminding, reteaching. I remember years ago, people got tired of Brother Kennedy talking about the same old, same old. You know, we're always in the book of Revelation. Oh, I'm getting tired of this. But he had a purpose. He had a reason. What can we now recall that he taught us? Do we remember anything? He knew one day he wouldn't be here. And he wanted to get us grounded as much as possible. Well, that's what Peter is saying. We have not followed, verse 16, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it with our own eyes, oh his majesty. Oh we're not God. telling you something we made up. This came from the master. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. And Amen. this voice which came from heaven, we heard. I'm not telling you something that somebody told me. We heard it. We saw it. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. And he saw he was right there with John and, and uh, James. We received from God, verse 17, the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is to be our master. Amen. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place I until got the it. day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. I got Knowing it. this first, that no prophecy, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. You and I do not have the option nor the permission to put our own interpretation on the word of God. We need the master to show us and enlighten us. Yes. And unless we're 100% honest, we can be led astray. Amen. We can be led astray. Help us, Lord. No private interpretation. Verse 21, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We have a more sure word of prophecy. We were taught by the best. Amen. We were taught by the best. And now it's been handed down to us. Amen. Well, how do we know it's true? Do you think that God would allow his word to be exterminated from the earth and still expect us to follow him? God has gone to great pain to preserve what we now have yes. as My his God. word. Thank the Lord. My God. Mm. Chapter 2 and 1 says, There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Amen. There's going to be false teachers. There are false teachers among us. It's never stopped. 
It continues on. He says they're privily bringing damnable doctrine, damnable heresy, even denying the Lord the body, bring upon himself swift destruction. My Lord. You see, we're living in dangerous times and most people don't recognize it. That's right. We're living in a time when all kinds of spirits are about. Amen. All kinds of thoughts and yes. mentalities and philosophies and whatever else. My God, help us, Lord. And we'll do well to take heed to the Word of God. Amen. Now, I want to end the message today by telling you a true story. A very sad true story. And I have shared this in years past in other places. But this, I hope, will help us all to see the seriousness of what it means to either believe God or not to believe God. Amen. And the only way, the only security we have is to have something down on the inside for ourselves. Even these young children over here, they've been taught well, I'm sure, by their parents. But at some point, they've got to get their own experience. They've got to learn how to make Jesus their master. Amen. And it's not too early to do it. Amen. They need to do it now. Amen. Every single one of us. Amen. Can we say, well, yeah, I thank God for saving me. But can you thank God for being your master? Amen. So Amen. Help us, Lord. this is something I heard about a, a good many years ago. So this is not new news. This is from the past. But it's still true. There was a lady, and you can look it up on the internet, you can find it there, her testimony. There was a woman by the name of Teresa Blaine. I wasn't going to give her name because I know this is being recorded. But nonetheless, it's open on YouTube, not YouTube, well, I don't know if it's on YouTube or not, but you can easily find it on the internet. Um, she was raised in a Southern Baptist home, <coughs> and she was saved at the age of six. From what I can recall and what I've read in times past, she was a very tender-hearted child, and she was very eager to learn and learn to love Christ and grew up accordingly. And many years later, she actually became a Methodist pastor. She pastored for nine years and came to a point in her life where she began to want out. She began to look at God as though she was serving a taskmaster. And God is a taskmaster. And she felt that she could never quite meet his standards. So she served as that, as I said, as his pastor for nine years. And then she began to have questions in her mind about what she referred to as conflicts in the Bible. Uh, particularly about the role of women. She struggled with that. And as she continued to ask questions in her own mind, she began to believe that religion has so many holes in it. And that progressed into, or shall I say, three stages. And here are some of the questions she began to ask herself. Is Jesus Christ the only way to God? She began questioning that. That's easy to do if you don't have a real experience. And then she would ask the question, would a loving God torment somebody in hell for eternity? <coughs> and then ultimately she said, is there any evidence that God even exists? So as she continued to wrestle with this thing all this time now. She's a pastor, so she's preaching twice on Sunday, but she's teach, preaching something she no longer believes. She's praying for the sick, but she no longer believes. This is scary to me. And she felt like a hypocrite, which she was, but she didn't know how to deal with it because she knew if she ever exposed herself that she didn't believe all of this, that, you know, she'd be ostracized and people wouldn't want to talk to her and all this. And so, finally, one day, she decided, as she reasoned it out, she concluded, I'm an atheist. Now, this is a Methodist preacher, pastor for nine years, and she concluded that she is now officially an atheist, but what do I do with this? How do I handle this? 
And so finally, she decided on a certain day, she lived in Tallahassee, Florida, and on a certain day, March something or other, I don't know what year it was, she's going to go to Bethesda, Maryland, to a convention of the American atheists. And so she did. So that particular Sunday, wherever it was, that was her last sermon that she ever preached. And I don't know what she preached about. But she declares a freedom of coming out. All right, now I'm going to read the rest. Now she was nervous about it, but at some point she crossed that line and said, I don't believe I'm an atheist. And so here's her story at this point. She says, I'm nervous. And she decided she's going to go to this convention and she's going to make it public that she is officially an atheist now. Now this is a child that was raised in a Christian home went to seminary, became a pastor, and what is it that would cause somebody to go through all of that and then end up as an atheist? I'm nervous, she says, but at the same time, I am so excited. I slept like a baby last night because I knew I wasn't going to have to live a lie anymore. Such freedom. Moments later, in the darkened, cavernous conference room, you know, that's how, that's, that, thing, that struck me. You're in a big conference room with a bunch of atheists and they make it dark. Yes, my Lord. Sounds just like the devil, huh? He likes to live in the dark. My, so here she is. Moments later, she's on the stage. She steps out and this is what she says. My name is Teresa. I'm a pastor currently serving a Methodist church, at least up to this point. The audience laughed. And I'm an atheist. Hundreds of people jump to their feet. They hoot and clap for more than a minute, standing ovation, more than a minute. McBain then apologizes to them for being, as she put it, a hater. In other words, there was a time I would have hated you atheists. I'm apologizing for that now. I was the one on the right track, and you were the ones that were going to burn in hell, she says. And I'm happy, listen to this, this is chilling. And I'm happy to say, as I stand before you right now, I'm going to burn with you. A few minutes later, she strode off the stage into a waiting crowd. One man is crying as he tells her that her speech is one of the most moving things I've seen in years. Another woman says she too had been a born again Christian. Join the club, she says, as she hugged. McBain. I have never felt so appreciated and cared for, you know, McBain says later, noting that she has left one community, Christianity, for another. New member, just been born. That's what it feels like. But then, of course, she had to return to home and to the reality. She didn't know how explosive her coming out would be, but then again, nobody did said her husband. The next morning we got up, the husband speaking, I went to work and my son Alex texted me and said it went viral. Even the local TV station ran a series of stories about this woman. Advertising, obviously, something that was not good. So, I think that's sufficient to say you can have it and forfeit it. I won't say you lose it, you forfeit it. If she ever had anything at all, and perhaps when she was very young, she did. But listen, when we start giving ear to things that are contrary, this has been proven for thousands, millennia. We don't have to debate whether or not this is true. We've seen it. We've all had answers to prayer. God has spoken to us. Every single one of us in here are persuaded at one time or another and some more than once. But how is it that a person can go from being in this position of Christianity, believing the Bible to be true, and somehow evolve into something to where you denounce what you knew as truth, and now you embrace something else. How does that happen? Well, I'm going to tell you in part how it happens. Number one, it happens by listening to the wrong people and listening to arguments that you don't know how to handle. It happens when we begin to question ourselves well, what about this? And what about that? There was a time maybe you didn't question it. But it can all be proven. 
So when those thoughts or those people come to you with things that cause you to take pause, you need to examine your experience. Now, if you don't have anything and all you've had is an empty profession, then it would be easier to deceive you. But if you, we need to hearken back, even if we're not being confronted by these things. We need to take time to give God thanks for what he's done. Remind ourselves of the times that he answered our prayers, the times that he gave mercy, the times that we saw him work, either personally or congregationally or whatever else. Because when we start toying around, does God really exist? Well, what proof is there that God exists? That's what the atheists do to try to confuse us. To try to confuse us. It's good to be able to, to defend. Paul said, I am set for the defense of the God. We do need to be able to defend what we believe. Amen. There's no question about that. But some people are not going to accept whatever defense you have because they're already persuaded of other things. We're not trying to win arguments. We present the gospel. If people are not interested, we move on. But is Jesus your master? Savior? Perhaps. Master? What does that mean? That means that we're going to follow his words. That means we're going to obey his doctrine. Amen. That means we're going to love what he presents to us as truth. Amen. There are those in Scripture, as we read already, those who did not receive a love of the truth. And because of that, the devil slipped in and deluded them, and God backed away, which is why he says, I'll send them a strong delusion. That doesn't mean that God is delusional. It means that he simply backs away and lets Satan have us. That's scary. That's scary. My God, help us, Lord. That is scary. Help us, my God. Our beliefs and our service to God has to be personal. It has to be personal. And it must be experiential in order to stick. If it's all up here, but never got here, then we're not in a safe place. Head knowledge alone isn't going to get us to heaven. We've got to have it in the heart. We've got to have convictions. We've got to be unchanging. Now, if we are following man, we're going to be disappointed. Even man at his best isn't God and will disappoint us. I've been disappointed by people that I had full confidence in. Well, I can't follow, I can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater because that pastor or that preacher or that uh, spiritual, somebody I regarded as spiritual, disappointed me, then now I'm going to throw everything away. That doesn't make sense. Because we're all human, we're all capable of making mistakes. We're all capable of making errors in judgment. But we don't throw away our salvation because we've got some bad counsel, do we? Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. If you ever see me deviate, don't follow me anymore. Amen. Amen. If you ever see that I can come to me, enlighten me. But if I, if I go off, don't you follow me. Don't follow me. Now, it's sad to say that over the past nearly six years, we've seen a lot of failures. <coughs> we've seen a lot of things happen that were not right by any stretch. Right. People we held in high esteem. But I'm not, that's not who my salvation is based on. That's right. That's right. And many people are out there now wondering because they put so much confidence in this man or that man or the other person. And when they became disappointed, they just said, well, there's just nothing to it. And just went on out there and did everything they were big enough to do. That's not going to get us to heaven. No, we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. That's why even when you hear, hear me or Brother David or whoever else say something that sounds kind of strange, talk to him. Come on, let's talk about it. If I'm wrong, I can take it down, and I'm sure he can do it. Because we're all seeking truth. Amen. We're Amen. all seeking to follow the master. Amen. My God. Yes, we are. My God. But there are those, some saw it quicker than others. There's something wrong here. Something doesn't ring right. But because there's so much reputation and because there's so much esteem and all of that, people turn their head and said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. When it came true, then there were others who got devastated. And they're out there wandering in sin and don't trust anybody. 
But oh God, help us keep a relationship with God. Make him your master. Amen. Amen. Get in the word. Learn to study. Pray. If it doesn't make sense, come and ask questions. I don't know everything in here either. There are some, even Peter said, there's some things that Paul said are kind of hard to understand. Well, <clears throat> that's true of everybody. You know, you sit around with Brother Carl Catone for a little while. Right. You want to hear, you want to converse with a deep thinker and somebody that's kind of over our heads. Well, that's a good one. But he's good as gold. And he's humble. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And if he's wrong, I'm sure he can be shown. Amen. Savior, master. He's going to have to be your savior before he becomes your master. Because if you're not following his teaching, you can't even get saved. But let us not be as, and this was just one example of people that have turned away from the faith, disillusioned, disappointed, bitter, and just threw it all out. Said, I don't want nothing to do with any of it. Mahatma, uh, let me see, Gandhi, oh, way overseas, he's dead now. He, I understand he read the Bible and all these different things. I don't know, what he, I don't know if he was a Muslim or what. But somebody asked him, what do you think about Christianity? His response was, I like their Christ, but I don't like their Christians. What did he mean by that? What I see in the Bible, I like, but I'm not seeing it lived out in the people that I associate with or have come to know. May God help us not to be a stumbling block. Amen. If we're going to profess to be a Christian, live it. And if not, get down to business and get it. Or take down your song. May God help us because we are being watched and we're being judged yes, yes. by God most of all. Amen. So may God help, help us. us all that we submit to him Amen. truly yes. and make him our master. Shall we stand? What's our number? Page 11 in the evening light. Number 11. Time for self-examination. Yes. Are you truly submitting to all of the word of God? All that you have understanding of. It's so easy to get into a place to where you just kind of slip and slide and take things for granted and carry a profession but have no power in your life. That's not going to get us to heaven. Right. All right, number 11.
I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. sacrifice he made in order that we could submit to him and take him as our savior and our master. Oh, and he's so patient. Oh my, he drank it to the bitter dregs, took our punishment. Complete rest, thank God in him. He can remove all confusion and all misguided ideas and thoughts and philosophies. a Christian, you can join this one and that one and that one over there, whatever pleases you, whatever one preference you have, but that's not what the scriptures say, no, not at all. the scriptures don't say that, the scriptures don't give me the choice of among many choices, but there's only one, and then there are those who say, well, that's bigoted, you know, you think you're the only one who's right, no, we just happen to get on the right track, yeah. it's not that we're the only one who's right, God's got followers all over the world that we don't even know, but they all came through the same door. Amen. We all have to come through the same door. Amen. So Amen. it's not about us being better than anybody else. We need to be very humbled by the fact that God even enlightened us. Amen. When yes. the world is in darkness, Amen. gross darkness all around, who am I? Amen. That he would talk to me yes. and invite me and instruct me and allow me to submit myself to him as Savior, Master, and Lord. Who am I? Amen. Amen. Who is any of us? But anybody can do it, but it takes humility and it takes an acknowledgement of truth. So may God help us. And whatever truth you have, you better hold tight to it because the devil is determined to take it away from you. He is determined. The devil is a restless devil. He knows there's no hope for him. And misery loves company. And he wants to take all of us with him. But by the living grace of God, I'm not going to be one he takes. Even though he fights and scratches and tries to trick me and whatever else, God help me to submit to you so you can show me the way.